for you. Welcome. I'm Doug Casina. I'm an artist, a gallerist, a curator, and a collector. And this is Artbound, where we deconstruct the myths and misconceptions of the art world. We have the conversations here with artists that aren't going to be found anywhere else. Today, I am joined by the iconic Hunt Slonum. Uh, hi, Hunt. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Just to kind of give you the context of why I'm calling Hunt an icon, you can find his work in the permanent collection of 250 museums worldwide. Just in New York, he's part of the permanent collection of the Met, the Guggenheim, and the Whitney. Um, and he's joining us today from his studio in Brooklyn, New York. It's uh, the entire sixth floor of a building, uh, something like 35,000 square feet. Is that about right? 30-ish. And uh, you might hear in the background some of Hunt's birds. How, how many birds do you have with you there in the studio? Well, I have recently sent some elsewhere. We just have about 10, but big parrots and very noisy ones. And how many birds do you think you have all together? Oh, 60 or something. Wow. And they're kind of divided between your homes? Yeah, I have some upstate and uh, Beltair, my house up there and here. So where did you grow up, Hunt? I grew up everywhere from um, Bremerton, Washington, where I went to high school. My dad was a career naval officer, so he was in submarines. He lived in Hawaii, Virginia, Connecticut, Washington State, California, New Hampshire. And then I went, I was an exchange student in Nicaragua. So we went to Japan when I was a kid. So I was exposed to a lot of cultures early on and just became enamored with birds and bird life early on. And I grew orchids as a kid, which I still do. And all of this has entered my work. I was given an ocelot skin and an anaconda skin as a 16th birthday present in Managua with the family that I lived with. And all these things entered my work. And I've kind of just warehoused all of my um, travel experiences and contacts with me. I used to play hooky from school in Nicaragua and go into the jungles and look at butterflies and plants and a lot of <laughs> scary experiences but it was were, were you starting to make artwork at that time as well absolutely i always i was never conflicted that is the greatest blessing of my life since i'm like was in first grade i knew what i wanted you know we had to do a picture of what we wanted to be and i drew a picture of myself standing in an easel painting and i've been doing it for the last you know longer than number of years i choose to reveal barely under 70 at this point was there somebody in particular in your life that started introducing art to you? My grandfather painted. He lived in Minnesota. Uh, my grandmother was from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I always clung to the South as a home anchor because we moved so damn much. And I wound up going to school in the South at Vanderbilt and Tulane. And I'm back in Louisiana half of my life here. What was your grandfather's paintings like? He liked to copy things. Um, he did a lot of landscapes and historical portraits. Um, he collected the work of other artists. Knut Heldner was one of them who was a Scandinavian, Norwegian artist, actually, who moved to New Orleans from Minnesota. And I've actually collected his work in this lifetime. And my parents maintained a friendship with his wife, Colette Pope Heldner, even when I was a kid. So art dotted my background, and even in a, a naval environment. Was that your grandfather's primary profession as an artist? No, no. He was superintendent of schools. Oh, okay. But I didn't, you know, we didn't grow up there, and I didn't know them well. But he was a tremendous gift as a child. He sent us paintings and drawings all the time. So I grew up in an oil paint home filled with drying paintings. And my favorite story is that he collected cocoons on his walks 
And he would hmm. send them to me in a box. And I would come home from school and there would be a polyphemus moth hatched in my room <laughs> or a, a Luna or they were always the great moths. How in the hell he found them at all? Today, it's virtually impossible. But, and these are a constant subject matter of mine. But it was just such a great thing to have this experience of this connection to nature, the rarity of the great moths of America, which are barely viewable at this point. I think I've seen two of a nature in my whole lifetime. <clears throat> anyway, so that was really, there was just an excitement about the whole thing. And my grandmother was really into plants and would send me pictures of all these things in bloom. And um, so I had a nature dotted artistic environment growing up with Polaris missiles models and <laughs> the Nautilus, which my <laughs> father worked on, you know, dotting our coffee tables in our home. So it's the real escape from that world for me. I know that you've lived in New York for quite some time now. Since 73. Do you feel like bringing that natural environment to New York has brought you some peace? It was not brought me peace. I, to keep from going insane, I, you know, people say, why do you paint all this stuff in New York? Or why did Rousseau paint tigers in Paris? You know, Gauguin is probably my favorite artist, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I really related to him as a child in Hawaii. And when I see exhibitions of his work, I just practically cry. I got to go, I had a show in Russia not too long ago, and I got to see a lot of um, paintings that I'd never even seen reproduced in some of the museums there. It's just amazing. The level of spirit. I think, I think that's what I'm really talking about is spirit and spirituality. And that's one thing that really drew me to you as an artist as well is um, this obvious spirituality that emerges in your work. What is your, how has your spiritual practice informed the way you approach painting? Well, in so many ways, I think to want to be a painter at all or an artist of any sort is to break the stereotype of life um, or obvious professional pursuit. Uh, although today, the wonderful thing about New York is that it's good, you know, you're, being an artist, people don't go, what do you really do? Or, <laughs> and they have a respect for your time. You know, they don't go, oh, you're painting, you're not doing anything when I come over. You know, there's a respect for the process of art making, which I don't, I never found anywhere else in the world. How is the spirit? Well, many, many ways. I make marks with the back of the brush. I carve into the wet paint that I make. It started out as a reference to the cage, which is another spiritual reference of um, harnessing the senses and the cage is the body and um, the bird is the spirit and in harnessing all of these emotions and senses we can be pure spirit you know that's the goal but um, in the mark making and in some of the actions they, they've talked about weavers and they would say a mantra and weave a thread of carpet and I, you know, in the mark making I make, there's a mantra said more often than not while I'm doing it. And it's um, one mystic that I worked with said it was a way of letting light come through the work. There's a healing quality, I think, to what I do that's just a channeled thing. I've gotten, I mean, I've talked, heard so many people tell me that my work has brought them a lot of joy and, you know, gotten them through some rough periods. And that's kind of what my unconscious goal is. Well, I absolutely think that you're bringing um, this idea of beauty into the world uh, through your work. Which has often been considered a dirty word <laughs> in this age. I, there's one quote I have to give you. Yeah. <laughs> Marilyn Zeitlin, when she wrote my catalog for a show called Baroque Beatitudes, that I had in a museum in Virginia said in an age in which enlightenment and bliss are considered an embarrassment <laughs> on <laughs> Sodom's work is full of it.
there's something about um, this idea of beauty, of aesthetics that seduces you into having a longer conversation with the artwork itself. It kind of seduces you into having that greater meeting. With your work, I feel like you're, you're talking about your mark making. Um, and I, for me, when I look at it, it becomes very meditative to kind of observe those marks and kind of repetition of form in your painting. Uh, is it a meditative process for you as well? Yes, it is. It's a part of what I, I mean, it's what I do all day long, every day. And I look forward to it. I absolutely wake up ready to attack <laughs> my day's <laughs> project. And I have been feeling so grateful, especially in this time where there's less and less outside positive stimulation, to have this inner world or an escape. It's not an escape. I'm really doing something that is not hidden. You know, it goes out all over the world. But anyway, wake up full of excitement about the day, which I'm so thrilled that I've reached that point in life where, you know, it's kind of flowing nicely. I mean, it's not that there aren't ups and downs and problems and crazinesses that occur. And I work with healers and psychics to find out answers to why things go either well or awry, both. But I think that's such a great thing you know most people probably hate going to work or doing what they do but to be joyous in one's pursuit and never bored isn't that amazing <laughs> it, it truly is and i feel like it, it's so interesting to me hunt because i think you and i both share the same attitude on it could you Tell me a little bit about this environment that you've created for yourself, you know, the space that you're in right now. Because when I first came to your studio in New York, um, that's when it all clicked for me. I was like, okay, I understand Hunt's work now. Right. Um, could you tell everybody a little bit about your studio, about this world that you've created there? Well, I have to tell you that I have to create these worlds quite often. I've had something like eight studios in the last 20 years because they keep tearing buildings down the minute Bloomberg signed Hudson Yards. We, I had to leave my studio on 34th. How long were you there? Mm, four years. I was supposed to be there 20. Hmm. The longest I've been in any space was in the Stare at Lehigh building. I was there for 10. And the current space you're in, how long have you been there? I have been here six. And yeah. um, I walked into this space and my jaw dropped. I just thought it was so pure and huge and impressive. And we have great views. Not that I need them. I need walls more than views. But it had a real bigger-than-life vibration. And it really walking the length of it all day long is, you know, half a block or more. Maybe it's a whole block. I don't know. It's huge. And I fill my space with my things that I love. I love Gothic Revival furniture. I have pretty great examples of it here. And I have um, a conservatory in the front, which has always been part of what I do. I really think that the concept of the conservatory needs to enter modern life more and more, <laughs> although... Now the Thaleonopsis has become, I call them the dandelion of the Upper East Side. <laughs> I mean, really exotic things that you never saw in the 50s are now so available that they've become common. What do you mean by the conservatory? Is it kind of like this new movement towards biophilic design? I don't know that it's that or not. It's just having a garden in the house, yeah. you know, devoting okay. a certain amount of space to um, plants, and they're so available today and such a range of um, species that are available. I was making a joke about this certain kind of orchid that used to be very rare, and um, now, I mean, every fruit stand sells them. <laughs> Home Depot and Lowe's, and you can't get away from them. <laughs> They're still, I prefer Cataleas, but they're much harder to find. And Vandas, which are hard to grow. The bare root Vandas, I just love the 
have greenhouses in Louisiana and we grow a lot of them there. So having a conservatory, having living animals, um, my birds, I've always called them working animals, you know, <laughs> Audubon who painted them constantly killed at least 30 for every painting that he did. I have one that was is probably 70 years old now. And they're part of my, I need a certain amount of um, color. I mean, I've, I've always painted walls, colors, which now museums are starting to do regularly. But, in, you know, before white was the only acceptable thing that you could paint a wall and hang a work of art on. Hockney had a great quote about that. He said, if you put a painting on a white wall, your eye goes to the center of the painting. And if you put it on a color wall, it goes to the edge. Hmm. Anyway, um, so it, it affects the way you view things. And I love living with color on the wall. I mean, I, you know, and I, I have an armory and I got a color fan out and just, you know, went through and went wild and used things that I never even knew existed practically. And it's really fun to start with that as a base. Do you have collections? Yeah. Uh, of objects as well that you have in repetition of form. How do you see abundance interacting in your life? I guess to just be able to get whatever you want, you know, and there's rarely, um, I'm amazed at what I've been able to, I blink and I go, how did I do that? You know? <laughs> I write a lot of affirmations all the time, no less than three pages a day. Just, you know, Things that I've wanted have popped up, I mean, miraculously. So there's somehow stuff brings me luck. <laughs> it's allowed me to create these environments. It's not just anything. But I've even said, if you don't like something, get a lot of it. it works better as a group. You know, <laughs> like I used to hate old Paris porcelain, and now I must have 3,000 old Paris vases. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love them in abundant in group. It's really a magical environment when you go into your studio. You turn a corner and you see a room filled with harps. Yes. Uh, with some with strings, some without. You turn well, another corner and you see, uh, you know, a table that's a pyramid of of Shriner hats, of fezes. Um, you know, the, I remember there was a, a, a table kind of in the main walkway that was, gosh, 15 feet long. That was three or four deep with beaver top hats. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I love this connection of history with your artwork. For example, um, I know people can't see uh, see you right now, but right behind you, there's uh, one of your fabulous butterfly guardian paintings that's in a heavily carved ornate a uh, frame that just looks spectacularly gilded called Savannah Rolog. Well, and, and one thing that I think is so interesting too, is you create these environments for your work to be viewed in. And for me, I think, you know, it's very akin to installation art. It's about immersing yourself in this exhibition space where there's furniture and the walls and your candelabras. And I know that you and I have been talking about an upcoming exhibition that we're doing. And, and this idea of like a seance keeps popping into my head because of this reference to history and to object in your work. Well, I consider myself a little bit of a time traveler in these installation projects. I'm really excited to learn more about your properties and because I think that's so much a part of this idea of the environment that you create that uh, fills your work. Um, Hunt, how many of these historic homes have you been working on preservation with? Um, I have seven currently and I'm about to enter a new project with a castle in Massachusetts that I'm getting in June probably. I wanted to own it. I don't know why. And I kept like, asking my psychics about it. I said, am I ever going to own Maidwood? And they said, quit asking me. It's yours. You're going to get it. <laughs> One of them said, I see you waving from the upper porch. Um, and I actually have pictures of me waving from the upper porch. And I got a call one day saying that they decided to sell it. And Anyway, I was able to do it. I don't know how. It was pretty miraculous. But I also I like 
everything else, didn't realize how much work it was going to be. <laughs> so it's just like recreating this lost splendor is a word I love. And they're just snippets of what once was. And, you know, and I'm just saving little bits and pieces of it and patching together little trinkets that have survived and regrouping them with color, you know, gluing it all together with my sensibility. Anyway, and I also save furniture with my fabrics and wallpapers and, you know, so it's all coming together as this overall environmental thing that I do. Well, and it creates these just amazing interiors that to me are just so enchanting. That's the word. I love that word, enchanting. You, you're referencing all of these kind of spiritual entities in your life. You know, you're psychics. I, I suspect when you were in Peru, um, I know when I was in Peru, um, I had a very spiritual experience being down there. Do you have a particular practice or spiritual belief system that um, you adhere to? I try to meditate a lot every day and night. And um, there's a lot of repetition and mantras and uh, affirmation, right? I just gather things where they come to me. I work with the healer. In fact, I'm working with my Swedish healer tonight, who's just been profound in her channeling. It's just mm. so amazing. And we've talked to so many great beings that way. Um, so we're kind of talking a little bit about people that you've had in your life that are, you know, more kind of on the spiritual side, who are some of these people that have really kind of come into your life that influenced your art? I mean, moving to New York was probably, you know, I went to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. I was born in Maine. A lot of people think I was born in New Orleans and I don't say anything, but <laughs> I was actually born on an island in Maine. <clears throat> and between my junior and senior year at Tulane, I was accepted at the Skowhegan School, which just changed my life. I mean, I just got on a bus and moved to New York after I went to the Banff School in Fine Arts in Canada. But we had Louise Nevels and Alice Neal and all these Alex Katz came. Um, Paul Georges was a painter that was a big influence on me at Skowhegan. Um, Al Held and uh, Sylvia Stone were there. Even Betty Davis came that summer to be there, and I got to meet her. I don't know if that school means anything to you, but it was life-changing for me, who had been not an East Coast-oriented person, and to meet all these kids from all these great schools with, and to be encouraged in spite of... <laughs> All, you know, going to practically artless places uh, just made me hunger for New York. And I just came here and I met so many people. And, you know, Studio 54 was very much alive at that time when I used to go five nights a week. And I hung out a lot with Ruth Kliegman, who was in the car accident with Pollock. And she actually got me my first show in New York. And I met Sylvia Miles through her, and we hung out for about 40 years. This year has been a really, aside from COVID, I've lost dear, dear friends. Mm. Monique Von Voren, who was a singer and star of Warhol's film. Frankenstein, um, she was in Gigi and 50 other films. And Sylvia Miles and I were really close for many, many years. So it's, and then my brother, anyway, I don't want to tell my whole life story here, but my brother died four years ago as well. He was when he died. They did a two and a half page thing on him in the Times, called him the King of the Red Carpet. And I remember <laughs> Cindy Adams one night said to me, "The difference between me and your brother is that your brother likes this, and I hate it." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he really got such a charge out of being everywhere, and um, he was like an encyclopedia of who anybody was. I don't keep up that, and I miss him so terribly. It was anyway. Here we are, and the world is still wonderful in spite of what's going on. And, you know, you just turn inside for your inspiration. And What has really changed for you through the pandemic? And has there been anything that has changed in your practice that you really feel like you'll continue with moving forward? 
Well, I have less disruptions, I guess. I don't go out. I mean, I try to go out three nights a week. And I'm doing all this new work in sculpture. And um, I just had a show at the Rothko Museum in Latvia. Um, and it's going to travel to Lithuania, where my ancestry is. Everything's going out. I'm not going to, I'm not having book signings. I do a lot of books, which I love being part of. I have a new one coming out next fall. It's a whole different thing. So it's all about, I'm revisiting things. I didn't have the focus to do my ocelot paintings, which you like. I haven't done those for 20 years. You know, and during the beginning of the pandemic, when I was in complete isolation, I was afraid to take an Uber even, because we were losing like 800 people a day here. It was so frightening. And nobody would come in. Eric and I, who works with me, Eric Firestone, were the only two that came in pretty much for months. I mean, you know, not seeing people, Fellini's, Juliet and the Spirits, I must have watched 50 times by now. <laughs> I, I remember I, uh, you know, was in your studio just like a week or two before New York really shut down. Um, and, uh, that was just such a interesting time. I, I, you know, certainly wasn't expecting, you know, obviously everything that uh, came afterwards. And we're still there. I mean, we're not, yep. I mean, I feel that there's more optimism now. Anyway, it was pretty scary and unnerving from a physical standpoint. Absolutely. And people are still, you know, I know I've had five people that I know, gotten sick recently so it's not mm -hmm. over but i haven't lost many friends just one in particular a, a couple artists that i work with have just recently contracted COVID as well so it's uh yeah we're we're still in the heart of it before we we have just a, a little while left in the program and and one thing i want to kind of dive into is some of your more iconic subject matter that you uh have worked with so i, I feel like bunnies <laughs> well sure let's talk about bunnies where, where did the bunny emerge in the late 70s i started doing paintings of saints mostly of an american some contact with the americas of the american population. I painted San Martin de Porres, who was from Peru, but wasn't made a saint until the 1960s. Rose of Lima, who um, was one of the first saints of the New World. And I went to Peru and visited their, the places that they lived and meditated. And then there was all of this activity around saint paintings. I was asked to be in shows. I was on the cover of the Times arts and leisure section on religion has impact on contemporary art was the title of a big painting i did of san martin de porres which um the newark museum later bought the met bought the first one i did out of a show at harm bukart gallery on his saint's day so there were all of these mystical miracles that were happening to me and i got a little annoyed because they would always talk more about San Martin than me when they were right. <laughs> and I had a dream where he was laughing at me. So I had this message through the saints I paint, and I'm staring at one right now of Dr. Gregorio Hernandez. One of them be was on the cover of Tamla Janowitz's book, American Dad. <clears throat> and I had a complete dream of that painting before I painted it. And that has not happened to me much. I read once that Jasper Johns had that same experience but it's only happened to me once. So at the foot of these saints, I would throw in extra animals. And one of the things I was working with was families of rabbits. I was just putting these groups of rabbits at the feet of saints. And I still have many examples. A lot of times they wound up with St. Francis of Assisi. Then I somehow, I went to India and I came back and I got very excited about antique frames because I had to, frame a lot of my works for shows like at VCU and I really couldn't buy contemporary frames but I lived near the flea market and I was able to find all these great 19th century frames for very little money which I'm continuing to do although they're not so little <laughs> money anymore and I started doing little tiny paintings that fit into these little Victorian photo portrait frames mostly East Lake and I started doing the walls of the paintings, the bunny became the bunny wall. Somehow the bunny jumped out and 
became the majority of what went into these frames. Then I found out late at night um, in Chinatown, after having gone to some party, that I was a sign of the rabbit. I didn't even know it. It just took over. I mean, it really just emerged from nowhere. I always read in Florence Scovelshin's book, The Game of Life and How to Play It, that the simplest thing you do is often the most successful thing in your life. And the rabbit just like took over and one of my channelers would get messages from them. They said they would take me to places that I'd never been. And there were all these messages from the rabbit entity in the universe. <laughs> and it's certainly been true. I mean. Oh, I too am a rabbit sign. Oh, you are. Yeah. Different year, probably. <laughs> well, and, and what are you excited about that's coming up next? Everything. I love that. I mean, I really am. I mean, I'm just excited about what I'm working on today. I'm talking to about new projects with, you know, the people in Seattle that we're doing. We're doing some neon sculptures and we're doing mosaics and all kinds of things that I haven't been able to do for most of my adult life. I have dabbled in them, but I've never been able to really immerse myself. So I'm hoping I have a lot of shows and possible shows with installation aspects, which I love. I just did one at the Taubman Museum in Roanoke called Huntropolis, and that was great fun. We had a little seance room. One of my favorite favorites was held at the Ogden in um, New Orleans years ago. That's with our friend David Houston. Absolutely, David yep. Houston. It was wonderful to work with. Yeah, so these projects just come up. But, you know, just the day with nothing ever happened again, I just would never stop painting. I mean, I wouldn't change my life in any way. Uh, there are more and more demands. A lot of shows, and um, I'm supposed to have a show in the National Gallery in Bulgaria. We have about 10 things lined up. Yeah. And then other shows. I have a show in, in Maine. We're doing something. Uh, I can't even remember. There's so many things. I've asked <laughs> Allison to bring me a resume because I can't really remember the schedule because I don't really plan for it. I just do what I do all the time. And then people come and put it together, hopefully. Well, and I love that our conversation kind of ended up with a spiritual bent to it, where we were talking about those influences and how that's kind of shaped, you know, your career. Would you, do you have any advice for artists um, who are kind of maybe struggling with how their lives and their kind of art practice connect? Make it happen, you know, uh, reach out, um, focus, you know, meet everybody you can, well, especially while you're younger, because it's, it's more synchronistic and more important kind of as you get older. But when you're young, you meet so many I was blessed with that in New York. I mean, everybody under the sun, from Gloria Swanson to, you know, I can't even, <laughs> Betty Davis, just the people, some of whom I still see, are just so colorful and amazing and bigger than life. It's just great. Well, and I know in your studio on tables throughout, you have photos with these people that have emerged yeah. in your life. Yeah, come in and go. I'm looking at <laughs> all kinds of them. Everybody from Drew Brees to Padma Lakshmi. <laughs> As, uh, it's fun because you forget what you've done. It's kind of a constant memory uh, trip to see all these old friends daily. I like to live with all these photos everywhere. It's not an ego trip. It's just a <laughs> memory jog experience. <laughs> So, Hunt, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and your studio and your inspiration with us today. My pleasure. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Artbound podcast. For more information about the guests and what we've discussed, go to artistnetwork.com slash artbound. You can also find ways to connect with me and the Artbound team. We'd love to hear from you. If you've enjoyed the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. 
Artbound is an artist network podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted by me, Doug Casina. Our producer is Daisha Clay with audio engineering by Evan Rutherford. Director of podcasts is Jared Mayer. Executive producer for Artist Network is Scott Meyer. Trisha Waddell is the director of content. Sarah Van Patter handles all our marketing. And Vanessa Childers does all things digital. If you'd like more information on sponsoring or advertising on Artbound, go to goldenpeakmedia.com. I'm Doug Casina. Until next time.